Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Oksana Venek, and I'm a research associate at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, this event is co-organized by, uh, by the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium and Ukrainian Language uh, Education uh, Center. I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Dr. Uh, Mateusz Svetlitsky, and Dr. Svetlitsky is uh, an assistant professor at the University of Rostov Institute of English Studies and director of the Center for Young uh, People's Literature and Culture. Dr. Svetlitsky specializes in North American and Ukrainian uh, ch uh, children's and young adult uh, literature and culture, memory, gender, and queer studies, as well as popular culture and film. His most recent book, uh, titled uh, Next Generation Memory and Ukrainian-Canadian Children Historical Fiction, The Seeds of Memory, was recently published, I think, two weeks ago, with Raj Dale. Dr. Svetlitsky was a research scholar at the University of uh, Florida's Department of English, uh, a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Illinois at Chicago, a visiting scholar at the University of Toronto, and um, has held multiply uh, um, other fellowships. Dr. Svetlitsky is currently hosting a series of webinars uh, commemorating the 90s anniversary year of the Holodomor, which uh, he organized with other colleague, uh, colleagues, Rex Educations, uh, Volontera Kuriliv and Sofia Isai. Uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Sana, thank you for your introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure being here. Uh, I'm honored. I would like to start my presentation with a reference to the present and I would like to finish my presentation with a reference to the present. On October 19th, 2022, Russian occupiers in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol removed a monument commemorating the victims of the Holodomor. The monument, which had been erected in 2004, was called a symbol of political disinformation. The destruction of this site of memory reflects the disparity between two historical discourses. For three decades, Ukraine has commemorated the Holodomor and in 2006 recognized it as a genocide, yet the Russian Federation has denied the genocidal character of the famine. Notably, this year, this winter, marks the 90th anniversary of the Holodomor in which millions of Ukrainians starved to death. Officially denied by Stalin and the Soviet-controlled media, most notoriously the Pulitzer-winning Walter Durante, uh, the Holodomor remained on the margins of the 20th century mnemonic discourses. And moreover, commemorating the famine and even talking about it was prohibited in Soviet Ukraine, thus the Holodomor was often a bitter secret guarded by survivors, hidden even from their own children. Ukrainian-Canadian historian and educator Valentina Kureliv argues that the study of the Holodomor is crucial in understanding political processes in Ukraine and Eastern Europe in general, as well as Ukraine's struggle with Russia for the right to national self-determination. The growing awareness of the famine outside of the Ukrainian diaspora in North America and the rising interest in Ukraine's present and past have contributed to the appearance of new books for um, of various forms and genres about the Holodomor. In addition to publications by uh, Western historians, sociologists, and anthropologists, the theme of the Great Famine can be found in works of historical fiction for various age groups. Children's literature published in the last three decades, especially Anglophone historical fiction, is of remarkable importance in the transcultural transfer of next generation memory of the Holodomor, a theme I write about in uh, my recent book, Next Generation Memory, in Ukrainian-Canadian children's historical fiction, The Seeds of Memory, on which this lecture is partially based. With the rise of English as a global language, Anglophone books have become available to a wide range of readers representing various cultural backgrounds. Moreover, literature in English is more likely to be translated into other languages. Although currently, the Holodomor is present in books written in, for example, Ukrainian and Polish and French. In this presentation, I want to focus on studying Anglophone literature, including selected books featured 
in the Hrek Education's Hold the More Stories, Recent Reads for Schools, a free webinar series of talks with authors of children's and young adult historical fiction featuring recently published novels, picture books, and graphic novels relating to the Holdemore, which I co-organized with Valentina Koreliv and, so and Sofia Isayu. Historical fiction for young readers can be profoundly ideological, especially since authors often attempt to forge truth from facts. Creating narratives about history, writers usually intertwine the past with the implied reader's present knowledge and experience. Then it is more likely for children to actively read and identify with the protagonist's world even when it is that of the past. By forming a sense of personal identity through reading, children can also place themselves as individuals and members of particular communities in their homelands. This enables the transfer of next generation memory. In my recent book, I argue that this type of memory is of anticipatory character. This means that authors of historical fiction anticipate the readers, both present day and future, not to have direct links to any witnesses of the events they discuss and have little knowledge of the transcultural character of the Ukrainian Canadian diaspora. Second, they also anticipate the readers to know a different and sometimes contradictory version of history which they want to challenge. Third, considering the rare meaning of the verb anticipate as to forestall by taking countermeasures in advance, authors of historical books create captivating narratives that may prevent the cultural memory of Ukrainians from falling into oblivion. My book argues that reading, imagining, and reimagining history can lead to the formation of beyond textual next generation memory. Such memory created through reading is multidimensional as it involves the interpretation of both the present and the past by an individual whose reality has been directly or indirectly shaped by the past over which they have no influence. I argue that reading historical fiction can potentially produce memories that include experiences distant from the readers, but this process is only possible when recorded memory is read and claimed by the readers. Otherwise, as Ashford Earle maintains, books are nothing but dead material. The Holton War has long been present in Anglophone literature. It appears as a reference in numerous North American books. For example, Janice Kolek Kiefer's The Green Library, uh, Eva Stachniak's Necessary Lies, and Sandry Mitchell's Under the Unbroken Sky. In the last two decades, the Holdemore has also been present in literature for young readers. For example, in Gabriel Goldstone's The Kulak's Daughter, um, also issued as Redstone. However, until recently, Anglophone authors only briefly mentioned and did not discuss the Holdemore. As I will try to demonstrate, this situation has changed. Goldstone's uh, The Kulak's Daughter, reissued as Redstone, portrays Ukraine as a multi-ethnic country where people of various backgrounds have to struggle with Stalinism um, and Stalin's plan to liquidate, that is get rid of all Kulaks. The importance of the Kulak's daughter and its sequels in the context of the Holodomor is um, remarkable as collectivization directly led to the famine. While Goldstone is a second generation Canadian writer of German origin, the Kulak's daughter was listed in Lisa Grekel and Lenny Gladachowski's Kobzar award-winning collection Unbound Ukrainian Canadians Writing Home next to books uh, by such authors as Marsha Forchak Skripak and Larry Warwarek. For many years, Goldstone's historical novel for middle school readers was also the only Canadian children's book depicting life in the Ukrainian countryside right before the Holodomor, being set in between 1929 and 1931 in Fedorovka, Ukraine. Although these events are also par partially covered by Valentina Gall in her uh, semi-biographical semi novel, Filipovna, Dary of Sorrow, and Marsha Forsak Skripak in Winterkill, which I will talk about in a second. The Kulak's daughter, Redstone, is loosely based on the story of Goldstone's family. During Stalin's collectivization, her mother's father, a windmill owner from Ukraine, was labeled a Kulak. 
The grandfather was imprisoned by the uh, OGPU. His land was confiscated, and Goldstone's grandmother and her children were exiled to Yaya, Siberia. Although he lived through the Holodomor, Goldstone's grandfather was killed during Stalin's Great Terror. It is worth mentioning that in the first three years of the 1930s, more than two million people were displaced to underpopulated parts of the Soviet Union, most notably Siberia. These banishments were the most chaotic ones in Soviet history, as the exiles were provided with no food and no shelter. Thus, a significant number of them did not even survive the journey or the first harsh Siberian winter. However, as some of those who managed to survive later claimed, this inhumane exile saved them from the famine of 1932-33. Although it does save Olga, the protagonist of the Kulak's daughter, named Katya in uh, Redstone, who is 12 in 1932, and her three younger siblings, it directly causes the death of their baby brother, whose warm body becomes cold on the train to Yaya, where he dies on the dirty, rough wooden floor of the smelly uh, freight train. The loss of the child has severe consequences on Olga's mother's psyche. Eventually, the woman dies of typhus in the camp, and it is Olga who becomes responsible for the survivor, survival of her family. Goldstone openly refers to the Holdomor in Broken Stone and Tainted Amber, the sequels to The Kulak's Daughter slash Red Stone. After hearing rumors about another famine in the USSR, in Broken Stone, Katya wonders if her father is really starving. However, remembering typical Ukrainian harvests and knowing about the good crops in Prussia, she asks, why would people starve? Did they have a bad harvest, early frost, hail, was there a drought? Why else, what else can destroy a crop? Her questions highlight the artificial genesis of the Holdemore. Goldstone mentions Gareth Jones and articles in German newspapers with headlines like um, famine in Russia. Understanding the power of Stalin's propaganda, Katya believes that no other foreign correspondents are allowed into the countryside because probably things are so bad they don't want anyone to see. Eventually, Katya receives letters from her father who writes that things are very bad here, there's no food, death is everywhere, and asks his daughter for money. In another letter, he adds that things are still very bad, no seed for planting, please send more money. The letters eventually stop coming, and in Tainted Amber, Katya recalls that in the last one her father wrote about the famine, but she has no idea where he is now or if he even survived, further suggesting that he may have been one of the victims of the Holdomor. Given the importance of the Holdomor in the collective memory of the Ukrainian diaspora in North America, as well as the presence of collectivization in children's literature, it may come as a surprise that the Great Famine first appeared in children's literature, not in Canada or the United States, but in France. In Famine, published in 1994, uh, Muriel Pernan, an author also known for the first children's book about Babi Yar, introduces the French readers to the famine, which, as she writes, was strange and unnatural as it acted as a weapon in the act of ethnic cleansing. This book is based on the memories of witnesses and survivors with whom the author met in Kiev in the uh, early 1990s. It is worth noting that in this book, um, the Pernan juxtaposes the Holdomor with the famine in Kosovo in 1993 and relates it to other genocides. The first children's book in English devoted to the Holdomor was Enough, a picture book by Marsha Forchak Skripak, the most popular Canadian author of historical fiction who has written about Ukrainian and Ukrainian-Canadian history and Michael Marchenko, who illustrated Robert Munch's books. Let me say that picture books are narratives developing the visual and verbal thinking of the young readers, at the same time enabling adults to familiarize children with problematic topics in a safe environment. Picture books may also invite the readers to cross borders between artistic genres, languages, and cultures, and initiate an intergenerational and transcultural dialogue between children and adults, 
one exceeding the textual and visual narrative. Hence, picture books can stimulate discussions on transculturalism and difficult subjects such as war or death, further provoking the transfer of next generation memory. As Gail Edwards and Judith Saltman note in their influential study on Canadian children's literature, picture books are a particularly rich source for the exploration of national identity formation in which the hegemonic commonplaces and myths about history, ethnocultural identity, landscape, and religion, and definitions of community are articulated and contested. Notably, of all forms of children's books, it is the picture book that can offer the most surprising narrative on trauma as it is associated with the youngest, thus most innocent readers. For almost two decades, Scripex Enough in The Rings, a short story published in Kobzar's Children, A Century of Untold Ukrainian Stories, a volume of Ukrainian-Canadian fiction and nonfiction, which Scripex edited in 2006, remains the only children's English language text on the Holdemore. The Rings was an originally written as a chapter of an early draft of Hope's War, Skripek's first Ukrainian-themed novel. The protagonist of The Rings is Danilo, a boy who loses his entire family to the famine, but manages to survive and escape to Western Ukraine. This didactic story includes direct references to the Soviet atrocities and the propaganda used by the regime to convince Western journalists that the famine is not real as Ukrainians live in prosperity. In her detailed an analyses of Enough, Anastasia Ulanovich argues that this multimodal narrative written in the form of a folk-inspired tale offers particular insight into the role of traumatic collective memory in diaspora communities and implicitly proposes collective, not just individual strategies for working through such trauma. Enough tells the story of a girl named Marusha who magically travels to Canada on a giant stork. There, she is given enough food for her village to survive the famine. To trick the requisitioners, people taking all of the food from Ukrainian peasants, Marusha decides to bury the wheat at a local cemetery. Ulanovich argues that by setting a part of the picture book in Canada instead of an unknown magical land, Skripek and Marchenko echo anxieties and concerns that structure diasporic cultural memory of the Holdemore. Since the publication of Enough in 2000, the visibility of the Holdemore in children's literature has also significantly increased. It is worth noting, however, that for years, Skripe continued getting death threats, which stopped only after the official recognition of the Holdemore as a genocide by the Canadian Parliament in 2008. In 2019, two years after Anne Applebaum published her influential Red Famine and the year of the release of Agnieszka Holland's film Mr. Jones about the aforementioned Gareth Jones, two new narratives appeared on the Canadian book market. Marian Mutala, an author known for Baba's Babushka, an ethnic-themed series of picture books, published a short epistolary novel entitled My Dearest Dido, The Holdomore Story. Clearly didactic in character, the book is accompanied by numerous paratexts, a bibliography and a list of sources, a glossary of Ukrainian words, a timeline of the famine, a list of questions asking readers to research other genocides in the Ottoman Empire, Nazi Germany, and Rwanda, a note by the author explaining her connections to Ukraine and the Holodomor, a song and poem written by Mutala, and historical information about the recognition of the Holodomor by Ukraine, Western countries, the government of Saskatchewan, three other Canadian provinces, and the federal government of Canada. By including so many paratexts, Mutala attempts to authenticate the story and show its historical correctness. Yet children often do not read paratexts, and sometimes such strong focus on didacticism can be counterproductive. Although Mutala's characters are fictional, their stories are based on various accounts of survivors of the famine, most notably those mentioned by Applebaum in the Red Famine. Motala includes the dates and months of each letter entry, but leaves out the year. 
this may be her attempt to make the book more universal and approachable uh, to contemporary and future readers. Hence, more likely to provoke the transmission of next generation memory. Still, considering that the protagonist's grandfather was only eight during the Holodomor, and he exchanges written letters with his teenage Canadian granddaughter, modern readers in the technology-saturated times may find it challenging to identify with the narrative and the characters. This is especially important since research shows that readers who become personally involved in the story also obtain a higher level of understanding than students who read um, affirmatively or primarily to recall, paraphrase, or analyze. Identification with characters and their struggles is particularly important in the context of books for young readers who are more likely than experienced readers to uncritically accept and assimilate the values conveyed to them in a text as long as the text fascinates them. Becoming involved in my dearest data may be difficult, thus the mnemonic potential of the novel is not as significant. The theme of intergenerational exchange of memory appears in another Anglophone children's book published in North America, yet one not authored by a Canadian or an American. Karola Schmidt is a Ukrainian-Canadian uh, pediatric oncology pharmacist and writer whose picture books Tell Me a Story Babushka and Babushka is Homesick, both illustrated by uh, Vilnitsius Mello, talk about the Holodomor, Soviet deportations, and uh, the post-Second World War migration. In late 2022, Tell Me a Story Babushka was reissued in North America by Raycraft Books with new beautiful illustrations by Anita Bargigiani. This edition was met with critical acclaim and was reviewed by mainstream press. Despite being based on true stories, most of the books I talk about in my uh, presentation are fictionalized and to some extent tend to spare the child understood as concealing atrocious history with reader protective strategies. While Valentina Gall and Filipovna, daughter of sorrow, inspired by her mother's childhood, also limits the descriptions of atrocities, the novel is one of the most historically accurate and detailed books about the Holodomor. Because it is written in the form of a retrospective narrative, the mentions of the eventual immigration to Canada and the hints at the survival of the young protagonist and her aunt make the story more hopeful, even with the depictions of starvation, death, and other brutalities. Such a narrative technique, as Lydia Coccola argues, uh, reassures the reader that the outrageous protagonist does survive. Similar to Goldstone in The Kulak's Daughter slash Redstone, in the first part of the novel, Gal focuses on the deterioration of the Ukrainian countryside during Stalin's collectivization. Filipovna, the protagonist, is introduced as a six-year-old orphan whose aunt Xena promises to do everything to keep her safe. Against all odds, Xena keeps the promise. Eventually, she loses almost her entire family to the famine, but Vera Filipovna survives. The second part of the novel centers around the, the worst months of the Holodomor in the winter of 1932-33 and their protagonists fight for survival. Like in Enough by Skripik and Marchenko, also here people try to hide their wheat in the ground. Yet unlike in the picture book, in Gall's novel, the attempts are not successful as the food is found by the requisitioners who are searching for everything edible using metal rods, also at the cemeteries. Hiding food is also the central theme in Battle of Grain by Ria Good and Natalie Warner, another picture book which, unfortunately, was self-published. With its depiction of a child survivor of the Holodomor, Gals Filipovna challenges the assumptions of and desire for a pastoral, innocent, and joyous childhood. Initially, Filipovna acts like a typical child as she plays in the forest with Mitya, a lonely boy she befriends. She also plays checkers with her family, believes in old wives' tales, 
and desperately wants to start school like her older cousins. However, throughout the novel, she quickly matures and at nine acts like a much older person. Similar to Olga, Katya, in Goldstone's series, Filipovna gradually becomes disenchanted with reality. Yet she also never loses faith and hope. Filipovna is a very good student who quickly learns Russian, the new language of instruction. Despite her young age, thinking about school, she starts questioning the teacher's words and seems more immune to the power of Soviet propaganda. This similar to the previous Ukrainian teacher who was imprisoned by the regime, the new Russian one is not sympathetic and treats the, ch the starving children with hostility when they lose their family members to the famine. Even during the worst period of the Holodomor, the children have to attend school as, I quote, there's no place for lazy brats in the new order. While initially the children, including Filipovna, try to enjoy spending time together at school, they gradually become too tired and hungry to play. The image of the starving and shamed Ukrainian children is juxtaposed with the well-fed young pioneers brought to the village as symbols of the success of Stalin's collectivization. The pioneers see the starved children as filthy peasants who can give them uh, pestilences. Barely standing, with their stomachs swollen from malnutrition, the peasant children have to sing songs about golden harvests and the glory of Mother Russia. Told not to interact with the filthy peasants, the pioneers try not to look at them. When they do, it is always with disdain. The scenes contrasting two types of children reflect the power of anti-Ukrainian and anti-peasant propaganda present in the cities, which was used to convince Soviet citizens that the starving farmers were second-class citizens and carriers of disease. The Holodomor changes Filipovna and her surviving family members. As an orphan, the young protagonist becomes stigmatized and untouchable, especially after Father Stalin's decree that all of the orphans were his children. At school, children call Filipovna Stalin's bastard. Filipovna and her aunt survive, but with the Soviet regime and the destruction of the countryside, the only place Ukrainians can cultivate their customs, keep the memory of the Holodomor alive for the next generations, and build a simulacrum of the normal ways is Canada. Only there Filipovna can live in peace because she couldn't really live unless she was free. In Soviet Ukraine, achieving freedom is impossible. Other independently and self-published books were issued between 2019 and 2021. For example, uh, the photograph by uh, Kat Karpenko or uh, Babas uh, Chuks by uh, Lesa Milnachuk, um, and also the aforementioned Bottle of Grain. However, at least five major publications were issued between 2022 and early 2023. Aaron Litikin's mainstream novel, The Memory Keeper of KU, Adrian Lysenko and Ivanka Theodosia Galatza's beautiful graphic novel, Five Stokes of Grain, Carola Schmidt and Anita Bargigiani's picture book, Tell Me a Story Babushka, which I have already mentioned, and two middle grade novels by award-winning authors, Marsha Foschek's Skripuk, so Winterkill, and Catherine Marsha's The Last Year, a survivor story of the Ukrainian famine, both of which have recently been reviewed by the New York Times. Unlike most earlier texts about the Great Famine, which were, as I've already mentioned, either self or independently published, these books have been met with critical and commercial uh, success. Litikin's best-selling debut book, which was not endorsed as a young adult novel, but has a crossover potential, has already been translated into 14 languages, including French, German, Spanish, Catalan, Polish, and Dutch. Thus, it can be argued that for most readers, considering the wide circulation and mainstream character of the novel, The Memory Keeper of Kyiv will be the first encounter with the complex topic of the Great Famine. The Memory Keeper of Kyiv features two timelines, one set in Sonyashniki, a fictional village um, near um, Kyiv in 1929-1933, and the other one in Illinois, USA in 2004. So the year uh, the aforementioned Mariupol Monument was built, um, and Ukraine made international headlines 
because of the Orange Revolution. During his presidency, Viktor uh, Yushchenko, who became uh, Ukraine's president after a series of protests provoked by the falsified election, actively supported the commemoration of the famine. At the same time, however, the Russian Federation continued to either refute its genocidal character or deny its occurrence in general. In the introduction to literary trauma studies, Colin Davis and Hannah uh, Mertoya observed that being recognized as traumatized is a privilege not equally available to all trauma victims. Collective trauma is usually associated with the traumatizing event only. Litikin points to the structural character of the Holdemore trauma connected to the destruction of the traditional social structures, the erasure of various uh, markers of national identity, the refusal to let people commemorate the loss of their close ones, and finally, the denial of the occurrence of the famine. The Memory Keeper of Cave received a wide distribution. It was issued in paperback, hardback, Kindle, and audible formats. It also contains an additional set of book club discussion questions. All of the formats, most importantly, the instantly and widely available Kindle and Audible ones, topped numerous lists of bestsellers on Amazon, including 20th century historical romance, and have received thousands of positive reader reviews on various platforms, including Goodreads. Moreover, The Memory Keeper of Cave was named the best historical book of 2022 by the readers of SheReads.com, beating Kate Quinn's The Diamond Eye, among others. There is now a wide recognition of how past violence leaves marks on the present and future, how the past haunts us, and how past injustice needs to be remembered and worked through so that we can avoid repeating it write Davis and Emertoya in the introduction to the Rutledge Companion to Literature and Trauma. However, repressed and denied injustices can lead to repetitions of violence. This seems to be the case in Ukraine. Not incidentally did Lidikin set one of the timelines of the memory keeper of KU in 2004, right before the Orange Revolution, as at the same time, a series of sociopolitical changes occurred in the country. Most notably, the increasing role of the memory of the Holodomor in Ukraine's mnemonic politics, including its recognition as a genocide in 2006 and Russia's ongoing attempts at denying the genocidal character of the famine. The Memory Keeper of Kiev was published a few months after Russia's attack on Ukraine on February 24th of the last year. Thus, its readers were introduced to the Holodomor while witnessing another genocide happening in Ukraine. Like the Great Famine last century, also this war has been denied by the Russian regime, which in its campaign of disinformation refers to as a special military operation. Lidikin's second book, The Lost Daughters of Ukraine, which also mentions the Holodomor, will be published in late April. At the time when commemorating the Great Famine was prohibited in Soviet Ukraine, the diaspora in North America helped to spread awareness of the atrocities committed by the Soviets and to prevent the memory of the Holodomor from falling into oblivion. Now, when the Russian government is trying to destroy Ukraine and actively denies the occurrence of the Holodomor, the publication of popular and approachable books about the famine, written by authors of Ukrainian heritage, is of great importance. Although Litikin's use of two timelines and conventional heterosexual romance codes may alienate some readers, for the same reasons it can help her book reach many others, including those who otherwise would have never heard about the Holdemore. Hence, The Memory Keeper of Kiev may help its readers notice the transcultural links between Eastern Europe and North America and the past's impact on the present and the future. Similarly to Erin Litikin's The Memory Keeper of Kiev, Catherine Marsh's The Lost Year, published um, in January of 2023, is a novel about intergenerational solidarity, survivor guilt, and second generation memory of the Holdemore and Ukraine. The Lost Year, focalized by three teen characters, Matthew, Mila, and Helen, also has two timelines, and is set in Ukraine in 1933 and in the US in 1933 and 2020. Notably, 
Marsh attempts to make the geographically and historically distant history more tangible for those unfamiliar with the Ukrainian context by intertwining the story of the Great Famine with those of the Great Depression and the global COVID-19 pandemic. The 2020 timeline centers around Matthew, a wealthy middle-class boy obsessed with the legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, whose father, a journalist, a, a journalist lives in France and whom, because of the global pandemic, Matthew cannot visit. Due to the spreading virus, the teenager has to stay at his New Jersey home with his mother and Ukrainian great-grandmother, whom the family calls Gigi. Throughout the novel, Matthew connects with Gigi while playing Zelda, a popular video game about a princess who has to be saved by Link, a young man who has lost his memory after waking from a hundred year sleep. Gigi shares the memory of the Holdemor with Matthew. However, instead of telling him her life story, she gives Matthew letters and journals and encourages him to reconstruct the past on his own. Matthew not only learns about the famine and shares its story by creating a video, but also metaphorically saves Gigi by helping her come clean about her repressed and surprising past. The 1933 timeline tells the story of three Ukrainian girls, Mila, Helen, and Nadia Lomachenko. Mila is a privileged pioneer from Kyiv who speaks Russian, plays the piano, and lives with her father, a high party official, idolizes Pavlik Morozov, and blindly believes in Papa Stalin, the supreme leader of the Soviet Union who loved all children. Helen is an assimilated American of Ukrainian and Belarusian heritage who is initially ashamed of her roots, but learns about the famine in Ukraine from her father's family and encouraged by her Jewish friend Ruth, writes a letter to the New York Times in response to Walter Durante's questionable reporting. Nadia, the Ukrainian cousin of Mila and Helen, is the one who lives through the Holodomor and loses her parents and siblings to starvation. She escapes to Kyiv because her dying mother gives her a golden cross Helen sent them uh, hidden in a nightgown. In Kyiv, Nadia meets her cousin Mila, who initially does not believe they're related and dismisses her as clearly one of the Kulak children sent to infect them with typhus. Notably, unlike Helen, Mila, and Matthew, Nadia, the only survivor of the famine in the last year, is not one of the narrators or focalizers, and everything the readers get to know about her comes from Mila's observations. Because of Nadia, whom Mila decides to help, the young pioneer learns that what she knows about Stalin and the Kulaks is Soviet propaganda. Mila begins to understand that her life is built upon lies. No wonder I didn't know what was really happening, how many people had silenced themselves when I came into a room, how many people had I frightened simply by being Papa's daughter. I was a monster without even knowing it. She eventually realizes that Ukrainian farmers are not the enemies. The enemy wasn't outside us, but within. We are the enemy, Mila thinks. Moreover, she also learns that her father comes from a Kulak family and has family in the US. First, we were Kulaks. Now Papa has family in America. What next? Although Nadia is hidden by Anna Mikhailovna, Mila's kind music teacher, she is caressed on by Dasha, Mila's mate, who is trying to save her own family. Consequently, Nadia is arrested and put in an orphanage. Soon she is reunited with Mila, whose father is killed for lying about his Kulak origins and is blamed for housing Nadia, a Kulak relative. In the orphanage, Mila and Nadia grow even closer and more alike, so most people begin to believe their sisters. Eventually, their American uncle, Helen's father, comes to Ukraine to save Nadia, his niece who survived the famine. He is unaware of the existence of Mila, the daughter of his brother, Lev, who is dead to him because he turned his back on their family. However, 
by the time Helen's father comes to kill, Nadia has already died of typhus, and Mila takes her place to survive and immigrate. If only there hadn't been such a prize, but the ghosts of Papa and Nadia agreed, I had to abandon myself to survive. Thus, in the 2020 timeline, Matthew and the readers learn that Gigi is not Nadia, but Mila, who lives until the age of 100 with survivor guilt. Because of the guilt, after turning 18, Mila, Nadia, cut ties with her family, married an American, and decided to repress the memory of her traumatic past. However, with the help of her great-grandson, she finally acknowledges her real identity and shares the story of the real Nadia. Unlike the last year, which focuses on the importance of intergenerational solidarity between Matthew and his great-grandmother, Winterkill, Skripek's middle-grade novel, offers a nuanced and thought-provoking account of the famine and the implicated position of foreigners living in the USSR. Furthermore, Winterkill demonstrates that despite the widespread belief that until recently, Westerners were not informed about the famine in Ukraine, the truth was different. Thus, the focus on showcasing the presence of implicated foreign workers and journalists in the Soviet Union is the most significant difference between Skripek's novel and other texts about the Holodomor. Winterkill is dedicated to the memory of Raya Kleiman, who is also mentioned by Matthew in the last year. Before becoming a serious journalist, Kleiman for nine months worked as a, an assistant for Walter Durante, which helped her learn Russian. Although at first she was sympathetic to the revolutionary society that Bolsheviks were promising to create as Stalin embarked on the first five-year plan, she gradually drew disappointed with communism and Durante's reporting. Thus, Kleiman published a series of articles questioning the success of Stalin's policies. Moreover, her writing contained a strong feminist perspective and pointed to the difficult situation of working women in the USSR. Kleiman also went on a car tour uh, around the Soviet Union with two socialites from Atlanta, which gave her the opportunity to witness the Holodomor. In late 1932, during the journey, Kleiman was expelled from the Soviet Union for writing unfavorably about the USSR and accused of being a bourgeois troublemaker. Her expulsion became a major international news story, and after coming back to Canada, Kleiman published 21 front page pieces about the Holodomor. Still, until the mid 2010s, she remained a largely forgotten figure, and her death in 1981 was not even reported in the news. Notably, Winterkill is loosely based on a scene from Kleiman's article published in the Toronto Evening Telegram. The front page piece from May 15, 1933, contains a reference to the journalist meeting with a starving Ukrainian-Canadian girl named Alice, who had come begging to Kleiman's hotel for food. Using Alice and Rhea, as characters in Winterkill, provided Skripik with the opportunity to stay historically accurate while introducing a topic that most readers may not be familiar with and making it more approachable due to the focus on the links between Ukraine and North America. Set in the Kharkiv region between 1930 and 1932, Winterkill is focalized by a 12-year-old Ukrainian boy named Nil, who is the son of a windmill owner. In the summer of 1930, Nil meets Alice White, who, together with her father, George, comes to Ukraine to help local farmers with Stalin's five-year plan. Although Alice initially believes in the Stalinist propaganda, similar to Kleiman throughout the book, she becomes increasingly disenchanted with her life in Soviet Ukraine. Neil and Alice meet again when George White invites the local farmers to move to the city and help build the Harkiv tractor plant. With his younger brother Slavko, Neil decides to support their struggling family by escaping to the city. After the boys return, their starving community is destroyed. Their sister joins the collective, and their parents are killed. 
Consequently, the boys return to Kharkiv. While Slavka decides to stay in the city and wait until the tractor plant starts working, Nil is reunited with Alice, whose father is arrested for taking pictures of starving Ukrainians. Together, Nil and Alice try not to die of starvation in the inner city, where they eat garbage and beg. There, they meet Rhea, a character inspired by Kleiman, who encourages Alice and Nil to escape to nearby Russia, where there is no famine. As Skripik admits in the author's note, the children's last journey, during which they see numerous corpses, is inspired by Welsh journalist Gareth Jones' trip a few months later in reverse. Jones was the first Western journalist who undertook a forbidden and dangerous journey on food through Soviet Ukraine and wrote about the artificial character of the famine in a series of articles. The novel ends with Alice returning to Canada and sending Neil a letter suggesting that the pictures of starving Ukrainians will be published in the Canadian press. Thus, the world will learn about the famine. In one of Kleiman's articles published after her deportation from the USSR, the journalist writes that she asked a high Soviet official in Moscow about the real reason behind her arrest, and in response, she heard, truth, does it matter? Is it constructive? Winterkill echoes this approach when Alice and Nil meet a Soviet official who tells them that the Soviet Union is paradise for the common man. Moreover, the novel showcases how the Soviets refuted the famine and used Western journalists to spread propaganda and misinformation, positioning the country as paradise. While Durante denied the occurrence of the famine in his widely circulated texts, others, like Kleiman and Jones, attempted to spread awareness of a starvation in the Soviet Ukraine. Their voices, however, were overtaken by that of the Pulitzer-winning Durante. As Alice's father tells the girl and Nil in Winterkill, foreign journalists are given all sorts of riches as bribery to write lies about Stalin's five-year plan. Notably, denial suited the official and unofficial policies of many foreign governments which were afraid of going against Stalin. For example, the British refused to help starving Ukrainians and actively discouraged several independent efforts to get food to the starving in 1933. Wanting to maintain a good diplomatic relationship and continue trade with the Soviet Union, Western governments chose to look back and consider the rumors of the famine as overstated. Despite organizing a man-made famine and killing millions of people, in 1934, the USSR was admitted to the League of Nations. During the meeting in Geneva, most countries voted for its acceptance, including Canada. Using the character of Rhea, Skripik not only points to the links between North America and Ukraine, but also highlights that the famine was a genocide directed against Ukrainians. While Rhea is based on Kleiman, it is worth noting that in her publications about the famine, the journalist used vocabulary typical of the period and referred to Ukraine as a part of Russia. However, in Winterkill, the woman is the one who informs Alice and Nil that there's no famine in the Russian parts, only in the parts where Ukrainians live. She also encourages them to escape to nearby Russia and then get to the British embassy in Moscow instead of traveling to Ternopil in Western Ukraine, which at that time was part of Poland. Alice and Nil are shocked when they hear that Stalin is collectivizing farms all over, but he's targeting Ukrainians for extinction. They're being starved to death, executed, exiled to slave labor camps in the north. He wants Ukrainian land, but not Ukrainian culture and traditions. He wants the Soviet Union to be Russian. Ria's words clearly suggest that the famine was Stalin's deliberate attempt to destroy Ukrainians as a nation. Although she acknowledges her own initial enchantment with communism, like Alice, Rhea eventually recognizes her implication and wants to bear witness to the victims of the famine. Moreover, she encourages the children to do the same thing, aware that her singular voice may not be enough to spread awareness. You are also a witness. The Soviets are destroying photographs when they find them. The more that get out, the better. Instead of a conclusion, 
I want to once again point to the links between the past and the present. According to various news sources, in their recent acts of terrorism, Russians have destroyed numerous food storages and stolen tons of grain from Ukrainian farmers in the occupied areas. Moreover, Russian soldiers have killed thousands of civilians, including at least a few hundred children, since the February 24th invasion. Despite the photographic and video evidence of the atrocities commit committed against the population of Ukraine, Russian propaganda still refers to the war as a special military operation. Although most governments seem sympathetic towards Ukraine, some continue trading with Russia and refuse to provide the invaded country with military help. Just like in the 1930s, they seem unaware of their implicated position. The recent words of a Russian propagandist, the famine will start now and they will lift the sanctions and be friends with us because they will realize that it's impossible not to be friends with us, suggest that just like in 1932-33, Russia wants the West to ignore another genocide committed against Ukrainians and be friends with Putin's regime. However, in the current sociopolitical situation, it is impossible not to recognize the transnational consequences of the ongoing war. Thank you. Amadeus, thank you so much for amazing lecture. I learned a lot. So my first question is about motivation. I'm wondering why the authors of these books decided to write books specifically for children. Are they educators? Did they want their old children to learn their own story? I was impressed by the variety of books. And I was trying to think about Ukrainian books uh, addressed to children, and I actually couldn't remember any. Probably there are a few, but I, ju I just don't remember for now. So can you please uh, talk a little bit about this disbalance? There is maybe few uh, children's books on Holodomor in Ukraine. For Ukraine, this is kind of the main memory of the Holodomor. And there are a variety of books are written here in Canada that it's much more family memory than a nation, a nation memory. The last question is about the difference, uh, difference uh, between the books uh, addressed for children and adult book, books. Uh, can you elaborate difference on like narratives, uh, genre, or protagonist. I'm more specifically interested what was silent in the book addressed for children. Thank you. There's no right answer to this question. Some of these authors are educators and the, their main, I think, goal is to educate other authors. It's just their voice. Their voice is more suitable, you know, um, uh, to younger readers. And also, I, we would have to ask them, um, for sure, really for, for sure. So I have asked some of them, and I did hear this answer, so when it comes to the voice. So one of these authors told me that that's her voice. That's So when she wrote her first novel, it was not supposed to be a YA book, it was just a book, but her publisher told her, but this is a YA book. Your voice is suitable you know, for this um, audience. And, and then she realized that, okay, maybe, maybe that's my voice. I know that the categories of, or, or, of good and bad in the context of literature are just, should not be used. But let's say a good children's book has to be captivating. It has to be readable. When children are captivated, when they uh, identify with the protagonist, when they identify with a story, with, when they identify with the adventure, or when they identify with the beautiful pictures, with the great illustrations, they want to re continue rereading, you know, these books. When books are not really captivating, but they're overly educational and didactic, it's counterproductive, and I, and I said it earlier, it can be counterproductive when a book is overly didactic. Children feel it. And this is connected to your other question about the situation of uh, the Holodomor in Ukrainian children's literature and, and in Ukrainian education, because I have talked with many people about this topic with uh, some of my wonderful Ukrainian colleagues specializing in children's literature and education, uh, who have told me uh, that 
uh, in the Ukrainian context, it's all really, really sad and, and, tra and traumatizing and, and, and children don't really want to talk about this topic because they're instantly triggered because that's the way the curriculum is built. So the focus is on all of these atrocities, on the worst parts of these atrocities, while in the books I talked about today, the focus is being informative, but also being captivating. These books are also historically accurate. And I think that when we're uh, writing a children's book, uh, we should remember that it has to be, it always has to be historically accurate. So his, historical inaccuracies are absolutely not acceptable in, in children's books. That's harmful. Uh, but there are also certain things which don't have to be said. And when, especially when we're writing about wars, when we're writing about genocides, atrocities, there are just certain things which can be left out. Think about it, when you're writing for uh, middle graders, they can be introduced to the topic and certain aspects you know, of, uh, of, of this traumatic uh, uh, history. And then when they get older, they may be introduced to other, let's say, aspects of the very same, uh, same history. Thank you. We have a few questions in our chat. The first one is quite excellent question from Sofia Isayev. You so wonderfully pulled together all the cogent interconnections between these literary works and characters from various angles. Thank you. That was very comprehensive and interesting. What rises to the top about all of this literature in the diaspora? Is it something about memory and memorialization? Is it thematic, for example, about resilience? Is it something else? I think that memory is, of course, important, but uh, memory is connected to identity. Memory is connected to history. Identity is connected to memory. Identity is connected to history. And, of course, I'm not only talking about you know, the, the Canadian, uh, Ukrainian diaspora in Canada, but just diasporas in general, uh, Ukrainian diaspora in general in various different countries. When you are a representative of a so-called non-visible minority, it's quite easy to lose your heritage. It's quite easy to assimilate two generations. You can, when, especially when you're a woman, you can get married, you can change your last name, and, and you can decide not to teach your children your original native language, and your um, identity is gone. So not talking about memory, not talking about history, may contribute to the loss of this diasporic, I think, identity. So uh, for sure, at least, I'm not talking about all of these authors, but at least some of these authors want to make sure that people remember. People remember about who they are, where they come from, uh, and also that this memory goes beyond the very, um, I think, naive and, and simple, uh, folkloristic, let's say, dimension, uh, so that uh, being Ukrainian uh, means more than just uh, eating borscht and, and dancing in a circle two times a year. There was one part of this kind of extended question, what rises to the top about all of this literature? because all these books, they're quite different. They were written by different authors. Uh, these authors had uh, different, probably, experiences. But is this something like in common that rises to the top? I think that there are certain similarities and there are cer certain patterns, which is a good thing. I am familiar with many books about other historical atrocities. And when a given historical atrocity uh, becomes I don't want to use the term popular because it's not the right word to use, but widespread, let's say, uh, certain patterns emerge. So there are certain books about certain topics and you just recognize these patterns. And I think that the same thing has started to happen when it comes to the whole Holdemore. So I kept on thinking uh, about while um, working on this um, presentation, while thinking about the books, there are these links, there's intergenerational transfer of memory. It's probably something which Sophia knows a lot about because she studied uh, testimonies and, and she stu studied the second generation uh, memory of uh, the, the children of the survivors of the uh, Holdemore. And, and um, I remember that in one of her publications or talks, she said that in many cases, it's the grand 
children who were told these stories, not the children, because the parents wanted to protect the children, but then, you know, after many years, they shared the story with, uh, with their grandchildren. And this is something that um, is uh, visible in, in many of these books. In um, Carola Schmidt's Tell Me Story Babushka, in uh, The Last Year, in Erin Lidikin's um, The Memory Keeper of Cave, so uh, in uh, Marie Motala's uh, My Dearest Dido, so in at least four books, there's this pattern of this intergenerational transfer of memory, but it's not a transfer between the parents and their children, but the grandparents or great-grandparents and their grandchildren or even great-grandchildren. Also, there is a strong focus on collectivization and the, the events before, sometimes the events after. In most cases, this belief that staying in Ukraine was not possible, so the obviously the... The, the grandmothers um, tell these stories or share these stories um, while um, living in the US or Canada or Brazil. Um, so the transcultural reference is also there. And what is missing is the Holdomor, as the atrocities. So in most cases, these books are really informative and well written and accurate, historically accurate, but the worst things, the worst atrocities, they're not discussed because these are children's books. A very good book, which I only briefly mentioned today, is uh, Five Stocks of Grain uh, by uh, Lysen Konkaladza, which is a graphic novel I highly recommend it. There are references to atrocities, but they're visual. I think that this book can be read in various different ways, and it can be read by younger readers and older readers, and you can um, explain certain atrocities while using fairy tale patterns when you're reading this book with younger children, like middle grade children. But for adults, it's striking. You know that these are um, skulls, that uh, these are bones. Yeah, so I think that surprisingly, because it's a graphic novel, and, while, and usually while thinking about graphic novels, we don't think about atrocities, uh, but this one is beautifully illustrated. It's thought provoking. I highly recommend reading it. My grandmother, she used to share the stories about the whole the motor was me, but my mom didn't know anything. And I told my mom, for example, this is what my granny told me. Say, well, this is for the first time. I, I never heard it. So the hearing from you. So that's interesting. To continue with Sophia's um, second part, well, she's asking. Um, so the following. Conversely, what strategies used by authors, by the authors, seem to be the most effective? either in connecting young readers to the history of Holodomor or as being the most engaging strategies mm -hmm. or approaches to use with young readers. I think that references to things that children know, so these transcultural references are always good. Most North American children are familiar with North America, uh, but they're not familiar with uh, the Ukrainian context. And because of these references to North America, uh, these books are more appealing to readers who know nothing about Ukraine and who have absolutely no links to Ukraine. Authors like Marsha Forshak Skripek or Catherine Marsh, they're mainstream authors and their books are read by many children who have no links to Ukraine. They love their books. They're captivated and they want to learn more. Um, so these references to the uh, pr present also uh, may be helpful for a present day young person to, let's say, identify with the text. But I also think that too many present day references, I don't want to say counterproductive, but such a book may become dated in a few years. That's a different thing. So now, that's fantastic. Children will identify with these the present-day characters, but in five years, these present-day characters will be history. Because we're talking about books written for 12, 13-year-olds, and for them, uh, events from 2016, that's ancient history. And so books which focus on history, history, I think will age better. And I'm not talking that books with present-day timelines are not good because there are really good books and readers like them but I'm thinking about long-term relevance. The next question is from Irina Skubi. In your talk, you mentioned that some authors have been mindful of their young readers so not to traumatize them with the pictures of atrocities during the famine and used some reader-protective strategies. 
Could you please elaborate more on that? And my second question is about the representation of materiality of survival and what place it occupies in the use literature on the Holodomor. So I want to use this example. So this is Marcia Forsyth's Ripex, uh, enough illustrated by Michael Marchenko. Instead of writing about deaths, uh, atrocities, a young reader can see these graves. When it comes to picture books, this is a really good protective strategy. The information is there, but it's not in the text. It's in the illustrations. Think about it. Usually, picture books are read by adults and children together. It's a process. The, the adult may decide what information they want their children you know, to get. So you may spend an hour talking about this illustration and explaining things if you want to. If you think that your child is ready, if you think that your child is not ready, you don't have to do that, but you have the opportunity, yeah? So I think that's uh, one of the uh, strategies. Once again, I'm not talking about not being historically accurate. Accuracy is very important, yes? Uh, but just talking about things which a child may understand, things which a person who's, let's say, 12 can comprehend. Not everything has to be uh, included in such a book. Uh, children's books tend to be shorter, uh, focused on uh, fewer, let's say, things. So there are fewer characters, I mean, major characters. Yeah, so these are also, I think, protective strategies. In all of these books, it's highlighted that these children had to fight to survive, that it was not a coincidence, it's not that they were lucky. They all had to fight to survive. That survival was not easy. It, of course, historically accurate. And the fact that children um, who in these books are 9 or 12 act like much older uh, people, like much older individuals, um, is also historically accurate because these children had to fight to survive. There are references to uh, finding food, um, for example, and just escaping the police. The next question is from Marta Bazuk. So she writes, Thank you for a wonderful and comprehensive examination of the topic. What has surprised you in how the authors you have discussed have written on the topic of the Holodomor? Do you see the Holodomor as fertile for more children's literature or has the topic been fully explored? And the last question is, are there aspects that you would like to see addressed that haven't? Yeah, and I have already started thinking about it. In this book, I have a longer chapter about the Holdemore in children's literature, and I have already published um, a different um, article about Marcia Skripik's uh, Winter Kill. After finishing working on this book, she published Winter Kill, and I read it, and I realized that I have to write something about it uh, because it's really great. I also have an upcoming article about Aaron Litikens, the memory keeper of KU, and I'm working on an article about the last year, so I'm, <laughs> we're, we're getting there. I spent a few years working on this book. I went through different databases. Uh, I spent a few months working at the International Youth Library in Munich, and I really did my best to find all of the existing books about um, the Holdemore. And what really surprised me was that between um, 2000 and 2019, practically nothing was published in English. That really surprised me because somehow I expected many other books to be there somewhere hidden. What later surprised me was the sudden appearance of these new books. So think about it. I started working on this book a few years ago, and I realized, okay, I really want to have a chapter about the Holdemore, but there are two books in English, both by Marcia for Sixth Suddenly, all of the others were published. So the very first draft of the chapter about the Holdemore from my book was really short, and now it's really long, and I had to just leave some things from it. So that, that really surprised me. What also surprised me were these brief, sometimes direct and sometimes indirect references to the, the Holdemore in other books, which I found like books for adults, but also children's books. So the famine in Russia, because unfortunately that's how it's sometimes uh, referred to. It made me 
realized that, okay, so there's this misconception that no one knew, yet everyone did. So I'm talking about books published in the 90s, in the uh, early 2000s. There are references to the famines. I'm not saying that everyone, of course, knew about it, but there were many intellectuals who didn't know about it. So that really surprised me that there are all of these references, many references. What also surprised me was that um, until recently, um, major publishers were uh, not willing to publish books about this topic. That really surprised me. And I'm very happy that this, this has changed. That's why in my today's presentation, I wanted to focus on some of the latest publications. So uh, Marsha uh, Forsyth's Scrapbook Winter Kill, uh, Catherine Marsh's The Lost Year, and Aaron Litigan's The Memory Keeper, because these are mainstream books. That's something exceptional, because in 2018, there was literally nothing. In 2019, independently published, self-published books uh, also uh, were, uh, were issued, and now we have major uh, publications. But by major, I mean books which you can, you can go to the nearest bookstore and you can get Winter Kill. And the last year, and I checked, I went to a few bookstores earlier today uh, in Edmonton, and they did have these books. Of course, I think that there is room for more. I would like more picture books to be published and books for both younger readers and young adults, older young adults. We have these fantastic middle grade books. There are some books for, for adults. There are some picture books. Carola Schmidt's uh, Tell Me a Story Babushka, it's a fantastic picture book. I think the illustrations, the new illustrations are beautiful, but it mentions the Holdemore. It's, it's an important theme in this book, but it's, I think that the, the exiles to Siberia are uh, a bit more important than uh, the famine, so th there aren't as many uh, double spread pages depicted to the, the famine. I would like more books like that to appear in the book market. And there's always more, and, and I think that there are other atrocities, there are other historical events uh, which remain popular with um, general, general readers, let's say the Second World War, uh, Every single month, a new book about the Second World War is published, and these books are very popular. But this may lead to other problems, the appearance of books which are not historically accurate. Because I have read many books about the Second World War, books which are not historically accurate. Even last week, I read a book, uh, I will not name this book, it's a book about uh, the Second World War and also Chernobyl. It's an Anglophone book for children, and unfortunately, it's not historically accurate, and I think that it's highly offensive, and I'm shocked that no one has uh, written anything about it. And it's offensive in the way uh, Ukrainians are depicted in, th in this book. Just to follow up on Marta's question, maybe to put it in a slightly different way, what is missing like in the Holdemar narratives in these books or what is probably overemphasized, what is still unknown or covered uh, insufficiently. Maybe to focus more, go to the direction that bothers me, Holodomor is often framed as a genocide of ethnic Ukrainians. This is evident even in the visuality you present, mm -hmm. for example, these crosses and uh, cemeteries, uh, vishvankas, and so on. So have you ever encountered mentionings of the other ethnicities who uh, inhabit in Ukraine, of course, and their experiences in these books for children? Mm -hmm. Yes, I talked about Goldstones, uh, the Kulaks that are redstone. Um, the, the protagonist of this book, she's an ethnic uh, German. Uh, so I think that that's quite important. Um, so the presence of ethnic Germans. And by the way, I highly recommend her books. Last year, she published uh, the fourth volume of this series. It's called Crowstone. It's also about another exile to Siberia. It's based on her mother's life story. Her mother was exiled to Siberia twice as a child and as a young woman. But returning to your question, that's the only example I know of. Catherine Marsh's, um, I think the last year is quite interesting in this case because the American protagonist she is Ukrainian, but Belar Belarusian also. Uh, so her mother is Belarusian, her, fa her father is Ukrainian, I think uh, worth mentioning. But this is a topic which has not been explored, I think, in uh, children's literature. And 
in literature in general, I think, but there are many other topics and dimensions of Soviet history which have not been explored in literature, uh, especially in children's literature. And there are also certain voices which should be heard, but we have not heard these voices. And I think that representation is important. Representation matters. We're still waiting for these voices. You cannot write other people's stories. And these are the stories which I've um, talked about. These are books written by people who wanted to share their uh, families or communities stories. And that's their perspective. You know, if your grandmother was Ukrainian and she told you about the Ukrainian famine in Ukraine, that's what you know. Uh, so I think that we should wait for the other voices and, and the other, you know, dimensions. We cannot write stories for people. And that's something that both Skripik and, and Goldstone mention in the author notes of their books, that they um, wrote books they wanted to read when they were children. Assume that any literary writing is to some extent autobiographical, which mm -hmm. is of course not, yeah. at least in my opinion, because we try still to popularize uh, this narrative and to represent it. Um, well, you talked a lot about the historical accuracy, mm -hmm. but this one-sidedness is not very accurate. You know, in the context of the books I uh, talked about today, these are children's books. In a children's book, you cannot mention everything. And I talked about these uh, strategies, uh, things which are mentioned, things which are not mentioned. You always need to make a decision. You cannot write about everything if you decide to write about everything. And there are books, I know books, uh, which were endorsed as young, adult, let's say children's books, which uh, contained references to everything. No one read them. You have to focus on something. And I don't think that you can write a nuanced book if, it's, if it cannot be longer than 150 pages. It has to appeal to a certain demographic. I absolutely do not think that the authors of these books um, wanted to pretend things or wanted not to write about things. They had to make uh, decisions. You cannot write about everything, but everything should be written about. But <laughs> We have a few comments. The comments from Christian Alexander. You've given so much to think about. Thank you for this brilliant talk. Can't wait to read your book. Ulyana Pizamecki. Clearly such children's literature excels in its use of powerful expressive metaphors. Marta Bazuk. That is so interesting. So I suppose she responded to your, <laughs> to your you. answers. Marsha Skripuch. It was extremely risky for a children's author to write on this topic 20 years ago. Yes. It's good that this is uh, no longer the case. Sofia Isayev. To regimes, a memoir not written for children is being taught to children in the U.S., talks about Holocaust and Holodomor, the new book. And we will finish with the last question from Ulyana Pizamecki. She writes, thank you for a fascinating layered exploration of what, is, of what it means to write and illustrate for the young reader about the stark realities of lived horrific experiences. What arose in your mind from the books you have examined about the nature of childhood then and now? I think that the prism of childhood helps the young reader to appreciate the stories with criticality, even if they may not realize they are exercising their critical faculties. Thank you for these positive comments. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate them, and thank you for the question. Maybe instead of answering that last question, which was more of a comment, I, I also want to um, give a comment. Children are smart. Children are really clever and underestimating children is not the right thing to do. Children need literary children who are also clever, who are believable, uh, and children know when a character is not believable, when a character is just flat, when a character is a foil. And that's something we should always remember about as readers, as authors, as critics, everyone who has ever worked with children professionally uh, can tell you that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much.